Hello, thank you everybody for being here. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the curator of the Disruption Network Club, actually the artistic director now. I'm not really familiar <laughs> with this word, but actually I can use it now. And I would like to really welcome the audience uh, to these events and also welcome all the great participants that we are going to have in these days. And uh, first of all, I would like to tell you a bit about the Disruption Network Club. Um, uh, and, uh, I would like first of all to thank uh, our uh, main uh, partner, uh, Stefan Bauer and the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien. That uh, is already a collaboration going on since more than 10 years uh, with him. So I'm really happy <laughs> because I have to say that is also thanks to Stefan that we are here today. And uh, then, uh, uh, of course, I want to thank our founders, the Abstadt Kultur Fund Berlin, and uh, my wonderful collaborator, Daniela Silvestrin, the project manager of the Disruption Network Club, and also Kim Foss, uh, uh, the producer of Disruption Network Club. And uh, I just want to spend really a few words about uh, what we are doing here, because I think uh, is something important also for the future of the events we are organizing. And the idea of calling it Disruption Network Club comes from the discourse of disruption, that means to try to interfere and also acting from inside the systems. And at the same time, we are also creating a network. So we have the idea of bringing the people together and trying to analyze the matters from different point of views and also different perspectives. And the people that we are going to invite from now and also until December 2015, because we will do uh, other five events after this, uh, will be artists, uh, hackers, networkers, uh, whistleblowers, critical thinkers, and also entrepreneurs. So, so our perspective is mainly to try to create uh, a dialogue on the use of technology, but at the same time also uh, speak about the fact that technology is never neutral and uh, give a more political and social perspective on that. And uh, uh, as I say, we will have other six events and uh, just a second. Um, we decide to start uh, uh, our series with uh, a topic that is uh, from one side really challenging and difficult, but from the other side uh, is something that allows us uh, to reflect uh, deeply on discourse related to politics, uh, uh, society, and of course, uh, war. Um, and we decide to call these uh, events uh, uh, eyes from a distance because uh, when we are speaking about drones that actually the real name would be unmanned aerial vehicle um, is uh, the idea of speaking about an aircraft that is without uh, a human pilot uh, on the aircraft but usually the pilot is uh, uh, on the ground and at the same time what we are speaking about is a conflict that is operated at the distance and uh, often for military and special operation application. Uh, but at the same time, uh, drones are increasingly used uh, now and uh, also in the future will be uh, for civil purpose, like for example, journalists are using them uh, for doing aerial footage, the same filmmakers, uh, even we have hackers and other do-it-yourself uh, experts uh, that are trying to build up their own drones. Um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, the idea that uh, uh, you can use drones for artistic purposes. And uh, in these specific events, we are trying to bring together, as I say, different perspectives of people that have been working uh, with drones also from the inside the system. And this will be the case of our keynote, but also people that are trying to analyze the matter with a critical perspective and uh, trying to understand in which way also the civil society, the public opinion can act uh, concretely to understand uh, what is beyond uh, the drone usage, about the politics of that, uh, and also what are the power relationships that are uh, beyond that. And uh, um, um, so I would just uh, start uh, to um, introduce uh, our keynote that is sitting over there. <laughs> 
thanks a lot, uh, Brando, for being with us. Uh, I think uh, for us it's actually really a pleasure and a big uh, uh, moment to start uh, our events with a person like you, because uh, um, you totally symbolize uh, uh, the idea and the courage of changing opinion and changing perspective in life. And uh, Branson has been uh, um, uh, serving in the US force uh, in the Predator program uh, between 2007 and 2011, but he already uh, were part of the Air Force uh, from 2005. I think he will tell, of course, more about that. And um, um, I think that he will tell more about uh, his own experience uh, uh, as working uh, in the Predator program as a drone operator, but also about uh, the next step of his life that I think is also really important uh, to underline, especially for people like us that are working with critical thinking, with whistleblowing, uh, and uh, uh, the courage of changing perspective. And he's the founder of the project Red Hand, that is an initiative that he created in 2014 to expose mechanism of uh, corruption, manipulation, and wrongdoing. And at the same time, it's also a network that has inside the whistleblower, law expert, and civil advocates. And uh, I think that uh, this act of changing perspective and speaking out uh, uh, is something that we all should keep in mind because it could be applied not only on warfare but in many other moments of our everyday life. And uh, so I think now I will uh, leave the word to you. And uh, after this keynote, that will be 45 minutes, uh, we will have half an hour break, and then we will start with the next panel. Thank you very much, and thanks for, again for being here and our wonderful participants. Thank you all for being here, and I'd like to just open up uh, saying thank you to Tatiana and the Disruption Labs people for, uh, you know, inviting me and allowing me to stock, talk about something that's very uh, intimate with my life. In fact, it took up about eight years of my life, and it's continuing to take up more. Uh, but I'd also like to thank, you know, the, the Free Chelsea Manny uh, Foundation for representing Chelsea and Edward Snowden um, for doing what they have done. Um, I'd like to thank all the journalists and stuff that have supported me and uh, allowed me to, to have this platform where I would never have had this opportunity to talk to you otherwise. And I think it's really important that we recognize uh, these people are just as important as, as I guess sometimes, sometimes people think about me and people like me. Um, and I, I'm wearing my hat because I don't want the glare to, in, to, to bother everyone, so just uh, put y'all at ease. Um, but uh, I was, so I was in the Air Force for um, eight years, from 2005 until 2000 and, uh, 2013, actually, two years in the reserves. Um, I joined the uh, drone program in April 12th of 2006, and I left April 17th of 2011, so I had uh, four years and 360 days of being uh, day in and day out of, of interacting with this type of technology and I've had a lot of time to think about it and I don't really think I have to, to tell you guys the danger of what's going on or, or with the surveillance and, and the, the lack of privacy that this type of technology brings to the forefront of the situation but I think that you guys need to know what it means personally from my perspective and, and the, the change that I had gone through in order to come to this realization. And um, I, I uh, in in the recent months, I decided that I wanted to I wanted to create something that that would last um, and, and enable more people like me to or whether they were in the military or they want to get involved with something like this to 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 have something that they can actually be a part of. And so I created Project Red Hand. It's kind of an idea right now, but we're we're kind of working on it. Um, I've been in, uh, some of the people that I've been involved with. Uh, there's Jacob Bridge, who is the first Marine officer conscientious objector since the Vietnam era and he just got his uh, CO approved uh, a couple days ago, so he'll be out soon. Um, I'm working with someone who's doing uh, sustainable technology in New Mexico, um, uh, someone who worked with the WikiLeaks party with Amnesty International, and so I've gotten all these people that are interested in contributing, but we're trying to figure out the, uh, the base reason, uh, what we're contributing towards. 
And so what I'd like to present to you, the idea of, of the, the idea of what it means to utilize this technology in a warlike manner. Um, because when the GQ article came out um, in October of 2012, it, uh, was it 2012? Time all over the place. Uh, so when the GQ article came out, it's, it was called Confessions of a Drone Warrior. And, and personally, like that offended me. That, that really offended me because I, with, with this technology, I inherently didn't feel like a warrior. And I had been studying, like, studying this type of culture, the history of, of these types of people my whole life. I wanted to be a hero growing up. I wanted to do something good with my life and benefit people. And, and so when I was in in the drone program, with all the things that I experienced, it was, it was a lot of, uh, I felt like a coward. I felt like we were 10,000 miles away. I was pulling the, tri uh, it was not just me, but me and the pilot were, were pulling the trigger. We're not feeling any sort of uh, uh, physical reaction to what we're going on. It was just, it's just a click of a button. And, and like, what, what's more cowardly than that? What's more cowardly than being able to kill someone half a world away and have nothing, no skin in the game, nothing wrong? And, and, and if you look at, you know, the American populace or the American media, they'll excuse it. E even the UK media will excuse it. They'll, they'll go around and say, well, we're not putting our troops in danger. We're not, we're, we're not hurting our own, uh, our own monetary value by utilizing this technology, we're, and we're killing them before they can come and, and kill us, and and that mentality is wrong because you're you're all of a sudden you're not giving respect to the other person's struggle. You're not giving respect to their their ability to live their lives. They're, as soon as they offend you, you're able to just sit there and I mean, not even the operator. Someone sitting in the Oval Office saying, "Hey, this guy's a bad guy." go ahead and pull the trigger, and, and it doesn't affect him. It's just, it's just another tally mark. And when I was in, the, when I was in the, the, the program, I would see a lot of these people use tally marks for promotional purposes, and that's all they were. The number of people killed, the number of hours flown, the number of missions flown, uh, how much signals intelligence that they can contribute. It, it, was, just, it was just a game. And, uh, you know, war is not a game. And I'm here to tell you that. As an avid video game player growing up, I would like to say that though, while the comparison can be made, that video games, the, 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 the types of skills that are involved with playing video games can be utilized in this technology, it's definitely not a game when it comes to being able to take another human being's life. And we all need to understand that. And it, it, it's, not just, it's not just because I was specially trained or because I went through the military to, to do this type of thing, but everyone needs to understand that, that what violence does to us, what, what, we, what, what happens to us when we witness violence, right? And so if anyone here has read da Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman's On Killing the Psychological Cost of Killing in Warfare, uh, he talks about like, like what it does to the brain, like where, where it affects the brain. And he, he makes this statement that, you know, the act of violence affects the same parts of the brain that is affected by sexual pleasure. So when you are in combat with someone, when you are, when you are physically hand-to-hand -hand combat with someone, it is just as intimate to the human brain as if you are having sexual intercourse with that person. And then as you get further along down the line, you've got the small arms fire, you've got the pistols, you've got the rifles, you've got the sniper rifles, and then you get to, to artillery. And once you get to artillery, he says that you no longer have a, a person that you're looking at in order to shoot. You no longer are there with the person. You've got targets, you've got coordinates, you, you're, you're, just, you're just popping a mortar in, mortar goes off in whatever direction that you fire, and you don't have to, to witness or, or, or worry about what you hit, you just hit targets. And then he looks at the bombing of Dresden in World War II, and he says that, you know, what they were doing when they were flying overhead is that they were dropping bombs, they were hitting targets, the same mentality, even though they killed civilians and all these types of people, it didn't affect the pilots, the people that were, that were dropping these bombs until they actually looked at what they were doing. And, and this, this book came out a while ago, before drone operations became such a big psychological issue, and I kind of kicked everyone in the balls by saying, hey, I've got PTSD. Um, so uh, where, does, where does drone operations fit in this? Because at one end, you're on the opposite side of the world. You're, you're viewing entire people's lives as they live them in the comfort of your own home, being able to get off a shift, go home, eat a hamburger, play with your kids, kick a soccer ball around, 
pet your dog, go to sleep in your own bed, and then do the same thing the next day. But then, in the same time, you're able to kill someone and, and witness the effect that your act has on those people that are on the ground. And I think that, the, the, I, for some reason, the psychologists or the people that, that, that created this type of technology thought that because of the disconnect was probably so big that there wouldn't be an issue. But then you've got people who are doing this job, who are going doing this job day in and day out, and also having to deal with the stressors of normal everyday life. You know, someone's kid is sick, or their wife had a bad day, or, and, and he has to try to, to make her feel good. And she's, she's wondering, well, you're here, you're here in the United States, why don't you spend more time with your family? And he's sitting there saying, well, I can't really tell you what's going on, but I do some things for the, that are pretty cool. And, and so, like, he's getting stressed out, families are falling apart, and, 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 but, but, and that's, that's the personal devastation when it comes comes to all this like you're not giving any ground for any sort of psychological relaxation and and they don't care the people who are giving the orders through all this they don't care you complain about it you 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 moan about it you you, you bring up something negative you say hey I need to see a psychologist and they'll say hey you can't see a psychologist because we're going to take your clearance away and that and it's said as casually as that because it's it's a way for the like they don't want to have to deal with the paperwork they don't want to have to deal with the people that are involved in any in this type of technology it's just it's tallies numbers promotion for them and I, and when we look at you know when when David Grossman talks about you know where where violence affects the people that are doing it and I'm looking at where drones fit in the matter it, it's it's your you're as intimate as a sniper without the excessive training. So, so you're, like, you're like a sniper, low class sniper. You're like the bottom of the rung. No one respects you in the military because they think that your job is easy. They're jealous of you. You don't have to do the hard stuff. And then, but you're also given this responsibility to take people's lives. But then you, if you look at it even further, we're not even given the information that we need to really truly know what's going on. We've got someone, we'll say it's OGA, other government agency, CIA, NSA, whatever you want to, whoever you want to say is gathering this intelligence, giving it to us, but they're not, they're not giving it to us. What they're doing is they're saying, this guy's a bad guy, or this guy's a high-valued target, or this guy's a commander, and they're having you follow through with their execution orders if it comes to, the, it comes to pass. When I, when I did my shots, the four shots that I took that actually ended people's lives, those were not high-valued individuals as far as, like, I mean, there was two, two supposed commanders in my second shot, but I don't know. We were just told that. I can't tell you who it is that I killed. I, I can't tell it is who it is that I murdered. And that's, the, that, that's, that's what it means to be a murderer is that you kill indiscriminately. And so, so my country, what they did to me, what, they, what my country did to me was they made me a murderer. I wanted to be a hero. I, I viewed what we were doing in the United States as a good thing because we were protecting, you know, supposedly protecting American lives, protecting troops on the ground, but they made me a, a murderer. That's what, that's what this technology does when it's not used with responsibility. And so, looking at where it uh, lays on that spectrum between close combat, intimacy, and, you know, the bombing of Dresden via aircraft, you've got this, this strange dichotomy where you're, you're so close to your target because maybe you've watched them for days on end and you know what type of, what, where their tea shop is, where their favorite tea shop is, they like to go with their friends, and you see them hugging their wives or playing soccer with their kids, and you see these things about their, their lives, so, it, so it's, it's intimate, it's personal. This is why surveillance is so dangerous is because your own privacy, your own life can be so intimately invaded and intimately discarded without a thought. That's the psychological cost of what this does. And no one, no one, if any of you have seen the drone documentary by Tonya Hesenshe and uh, Flimmer Film, you'll see that the Air Force, one of the Air Force commanders says, if someone can come up with a solution to how we fix this, they'll make the Air Force a lot of money. But what they don't, what they take out of that equation is what is, what is the care behind this? 
And so when, you know, uh, the GQ article came out, Matt Power, I, I talked with Matt Power about it and I said, I don't like this being labeled as, you know, confessions of a drone warrior because I don't feel like a warrior. When I have studied what warriorship means, warriorships are people who understand the nature of violence and understand the nature of war and they prevent war. They go out of their way to make sure that the average person doesn't feel the effects of what violence does in that type of conflict. Context. That's why we have, you know, cultures from all around the world have codes of honor. They have, we have Bushido from the Japanese and we have chivalry from the Middle Ages because these codes of honor, these codes of conduct prevented war from getting out of hand. And even though we look at in historic, historically, it always gets out of hand. War always gets out of hand. There's no, there's no way to, to contain it. But we can always pretend to follow codes of conduct and, co and, and these things in order to make it seem more civilized. But with the level of technology that we have today, with the the ability to see something on the opposite side of the world and the ability to interact with people instantaneously with the push of a button, doesn't that mean that this type of technology shouldn't get out of hand? Doesn't this mean that this type of technology should be used for beneficial purposes, that war should not be an issue? And, and they think these are questions that everyone, everyone needs to ask themselves because it's not just, like, there's a difference between soldiers and warriors because I think that all of you here understand what it means to be a warrior even though you've probably never studied the concept because you care. You care about what's going on on the opposite side of the world because you, you know what, that these are human beings. They're not demons. They're not sand demons or whatever anyone wants to call them. They're human beings who live in a completely different culture than what we've experienced. And so for us... What we need to do as people is to, to reach out to them. If America is the greatest country in the world, or we are as far as like the Euro-US uh, relations are the most powerful countries in the world, then that gives us a responsibility to, to not abuse this type of technology, and this gives us a responsibility to be the better person. There's no need to fear when we are the strongest people, and, and if we use fear as a method of attack to, to perpetuate war in this manner, then we are, we are the worst type of cowards, because we are the bully on the playground. And so we, uh, these, are, these are thoughts that, that run through my head constantly, and I, I, uh, it keeps me up at night. And so the idea is, like, we all know the issue. We all know, you know, we all know that violence sucks. We all know that, that it, it's damaging to the person who does violence as well as dist utterly destructive to the people who have violence done to them. So how, how do we come up with a solution? And, and I think that's, that's one of the key points of this, the Disruption Labs is to find a solution. It's one of the, 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 the key points that I, I want with Project Red Hand is to find a solution. How do we create diplomats of people that utilize this technology? How do we create techno-warriors? Because, you know, the, the concept needs to be adapted to how modern technology is using. We, being a drone warrior was an insult to me. It was an insult. It was, it, it's a cowardly method of warfare. It's the most cowardly method of warfare that has ever been created in the entirety of human history. So how do, how do we create people, how, how, do we, how do we make the label of warrior to people who utilize this technology or, or, or hackers or, or activists? Because what these people, what, what now we need to do is understand is how this, 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 what we're doing affects people in the most negative way and then prevent it. That's our responsibility. That, if, if we can do such great things with what we, what we want to do, then we have to understand that, that there is an extreme negative that goes along with that. There's this balance, and we have to understand what this negative is in order to prevent it from getting out of hand. The, uh, there, you know, I guess I can use the example of 4chan, if anyone, everyone probably knows 4chan. Uh, 4, 4chan, you know, the internet hive of scum and villainy. They are the Moss Eisley Cantina of the internet. You'll never find anyone worse than the people that, that frequent 4chan. But they've also done a lot of good things. And this is where you can see where, where this type of hacker community can, when, when, when they want to do something positive, they can do something extremely good. And they can spread a good message. They can disrupt. They can do DDoSs on all sorts of stuff. But, you know, when they get upset or, or something trivial, they can also be extreme pieces of shit. And um, 
and that's, that's because there, where's the code of conduct? Where's the honor? Like, we, we've lost this concept of what it, what it means to have honor in utilizing just every, average everyday things. Like, am I going to be honorable when I respond to someone's nasty email to me on the internet, or am I going to respond in kind? Am I going to, uh, I guess the idea is, am I going to respond in fear, uh, desire, and judgment, or am I going to respond in awareness, intent, and discernment? And there's a really big difference. And if we, if we utilize this technology and, and, and what drones represent in, in a fear, we're, we're, we're all of a sudden, we, we've got 1984 on our hands. We've got, we've got, you know, surveillance cameras on the street, and we've got drones circling over the air, and we've got people who don't want to go outside because they're afraid that, you know, they might, be, they might walk over across the field and pick up their soccer ball, or they might go, you know, farming in the field and, and be attacked. And they, they, have, they, they don't know what's going to go on. They don't, they don't know how someone is going to interpret their actions. And that's one thing that when I was in, like, we were looking for people to do nefarious things. Excuse me. Uh, nefarious things could be anything that they determined to be bad. It wasn't necessarily, it was a patterns of life. It was an algorithm. It was, it was something that when... This guy did this, this, and this, and it could be completely benign and normal for this person to do, but we have no understanding of their culture. We have no understanding of who they interact with or why they interact with or, or what's going on in their head. We just see these things going on, and that can be a trigger. My first shot, we took a shot on three individuals simply for the fact that they were carrying weapons. And on RT, Lieutenant Colonel Black responded that we don't kill people just for killing carrying weapons, and I can damn well assure you that that is exactly what happened on my first Hellfire shot. And my second Hellfire shot, what happened was I came on to shift, and they said, there's two people in this building, we're going to take a shot, nothing else is going on, it's five o'clock in the morning, and you know what, I saw someone run in the building, and I'm pretty sure that, damn well sure that it was a child. So then, then with, all, with, with all these things going on, you cre like, I guess with my mind, with my imagination, you create this, 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 this story of who these people were, like why were they there, who, like, like you have to find some recompense in your soul in order to justify what you've done, and I couldn't find any. It tore me apart. It was the, it was the worst feeling that I'd ever had that, that my soul was being ripped out of me, and that... For, for the longest time, a after my first four shots, I took th three other shots that were unsuccessful. Think whoever did that, because um, I don't think I could take any more. But I, I, had th I, had lived with, I was living with the fact that I had killed 13 people. And when I had gotten out, I, I had survived. I, I had succeeded in surviving the machinations of the industrial military complex, and I was a whole and healthy person who might have this burden on his soul, but I'm gonna go forward, I'm going to try to do something good in the world. And then when I, the day that I was leaving, they handed me this piece of paper that said, it, it, was, like, it was like a scorecard from a Call of Duty or one of those video games where like, you, get, you get credit for assists and kills and targets and all that kind of bullshit. And it was uh, 1,626 enemies killed in action, 748 high-valued individuals. That's over 2,300 people killed while I was in the service. I might not have any direct connection to that, but my name is associated with those kills. If, if my children and grandchildren Sometime down the line, they're like, I want to know what Grandpa Brandon was doing when he was in the military. And they, all of a sudden, these records are released, and they say, his name is associated with this. Like, what, is that, what does that make me? Without having to try to do anything to make things right, what does that make me? And, and when I, I'd already felt damned enough having killed another human being, but, but they made me feel like a legion of the damned was following me. And they were waiting for me to fail. They're waiting for me in the afterlife. And that is something that, that my fragile heart couldn't, could barely take. And so uh, I ended up go <clears throat> going and seeing a therapist. And uh, on the, on the uh, advice of a Vietnam veteran friend that I had met, he's like, you should probably go see a therapist because you're having the same 
reactions that I did when I got back from Vietnam and uh, it took me 25 years to go talk to someone. So I was like, okay, I'll go talk to this. I go talk to a therapist. I don't have PTSD. And, and at this time, I was, I was trying to get into the survival program for the United States Air Force because um, I wanted to get just completely away from drones and technology. Like, I never, I, when I left that program on April 17th of 2011, I never wanted to hear the word drone ever again. And so, in 2012, um, I, get into the, I get into the survival program. And, uh, I mean, it, it was amazing. Probably the best, like, I have to say that if, of anyone that I ever met in the military, these people were, were, were the ones that, they wanted to do it right. They wanted to save people. They wanted to make sure people came home safe. I mean, their, their whole motto is to return with honor. And, and we were, I was injured. Short, long story short, I was injured and hospitalized. And um, all, like, I, I, even the, like, when I was going through this, this program, I felt like, you know, I was trying to walk up a river. And I don't know if any of you have stood in the middle of a raging river trying to walk up it, but it is really, 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 really impossibly difficult. And so I felt like I was just walking up this river really slowly, trying to make my way. I was doing really good, and then I was injured, and it was just swept me along. And, I, and, and so in, when I was in the hospital bed, I said, you know, universe, if there's any way, if there's anything out there that I can make this right, please give me that chance. And... Here we are three years later, you know. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I tried to run. That, that was the, the reason I tell you that story is because I tried to run away. I tried, I, tried to, I tried to escape my responsibility because I knew when I watched the television, when I watched, you know, read the news articles, there was so much missing information. There, there was uh, President Obama, let me be clear. Drone strikes are awesome. And you're just sitting there, I'm just sitting there watching him, and I'm just like, this guy, this guy doesn't know what's going on. He's, he signs paperwork, and then he kills Anwar al awlaki you know, American citizen in Yemen. And then his 16-year-old son, two weeks later, uh, after I'd gotten out. And they excused it. That, it, was, it was just an excuse. And, 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 and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't stay silent anymore. I knew that, we were, that, that there, was, there were wrong things going on in the world, and that no one else was going to talk about them. And, you know, my mom always, you know, my mom always tells me, you know, you're somebody. Like, if you're waiting for someone to do something, you're somebody. And uh, so, I mean, I, I did. Like, I, um, Nicola uh, Abe from the Der Spiegel, she uh, found me. And uh, after I was injured and I was, I was kind of just like, sure, Anything that you want to ask, I'll answer, because you deserve to know. All of you deserve to know. If you care enough, and I think that's the first lesson that anyone should understand is that it's okay to care, like, you should know. You should know what you care about. You should know what's involved in this entire process, and you should know exactly what it is is going on so you can come up with a solution. Because, you know, me being in the program, me being a former operator, I might not, not be able to see the whole picture from an outsider's point of view. And, and you guys, and, and everyone else that I've talked to, they, they, they desperately need that insider's point of view in order to get that whole picture. And, the, and it's not as clean, it's not, as, it's not surgical, it's not antiseptic like the United States government and media would portray. It's not, nothing is. It involves violence and killing people it, it's gonna involve a lot of dirty work. And they're, they're avoiding accountability simply because of the nature of the machine. And that's, that's why you guys are so important, is because I can sit here and tell you what's going on, but who's gonna ultimately hold them accountable? I'm just one voice. You guys have given me a platform to talk on, but I'm still just one voice. And it's, it's, it's each of you, on your own merit, on your own responsibility, must speak not only to each other, but raise your voice whenever there's a concern. You can't be a citizen of this planet, a human being, and, and shirk that responsibility. It's, 
you'll be a traitor. If, if there's something out there that bothers you that you feel needs to be righted and you don't do it with anything other than love and compassion, you're a traitor to yourself and the rest of us. And that's a lesson that I had to learn really intimately and really, it was a really hard lesson to learn. But I've gotten a lot of encouragement, you know. I, I mean, everyone that's come up to me since being in Berlin has said nothing but nice, nice things about me, which is a lot more than what I could say about back home, where no one, no one wants to hear about any of this. And so again, I just want to thank you all for being here and, and um, allowing me to, to speak. Um, and so uh, I guess that's kind of my spiel, but if, I guess if anyone has any questions from this point on until the end of my talk, uh, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and ask. Um, Ma'am? Wait a second, we have a microphone. Oh, they're bringing you a microphone. Because nobody will un understand you. Uh, just a technical question, like I'm not really familiar with the ins and outs of how you um, proceed, and could you say a little bit about where you were located and what kind of a room that is? Is it like a regular place you go to and what goes on while the killings are being executed, basically? Uh, uh Okay, I, uh, I, always, I always forget that, because uh, I've exp uh, explained this, and there's so much media out there that uh, I guess sometimes people miss this, but it's a 8 by 8 by 20 foot trailer, um, basically a Formula 1 racing car trailer that they kind of show, at one end of it they shove a bunch of monitors and stuff, and on the back wall they have uh, all the servers and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's 14 monitors, so this is where the video game stuff kind of comes in, where you're monitoring a whole bunch of different uh, points of information that, that, and while still focusing on the central task. So you've got like the video camera uh, in the center, you've got the mission uh, parameters somewhere over here, you've got the engine parameters and wind speed and, and EGTs and all sorts of technical data down here, you've got the GPS coordinates up here, uh, you've got the pilot stuff, like pilot over here, sensor operator here, it, and it's, it's this cold, dark, room that's lit only by the monitors and it's mostly but really extremely boring like nothing happens for 99.9% .9 of you sitting in the seat um, then I physically outside of the GCS the ground control station I was located in Nevada um, on Nellis Air Force Base until 2009 and then I went to, to New Mexico as part of Joint Special Operations Command and flew for JSOC there um, and then there's, of course, there's other bases. There's uh, California, Arizona, Texas. But those are reserve, guard and reserve bases. So the main ones are um, the two main, or three locations, I guess, are Holloman, Creech, and uh, Holloman in New Mexico, Creech in Nevada, Canada, excuse me, Canada Air Force Base in uh, New Mexico as well. And then there's a couple others that have been created since that I got out. Um, but I guess another point is that all that information that comes to the United States from the Middle East is actually comes through Ramstein Air Force Base here in Germany. So while we talk about all this stuff, we have this, this we kind of have this connection where, you know, I have this connection with the Norwegians because they gave Obama the Nobel Peace Prize, and I voted for him in 2008. So we kind of have that connection of responsibility. But then you guys and I have this connection of deception. War is deception, and they've been using us to perpetuate this war. They used me to basically be the gun, to be the weapon for this, but they've, they used the German people. They've used the, 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 the trust of the German government or the German people that have had for the United States as being the, what I've been told is the great liberator of World War II. Um, they've, we've abused that trust and using you in a manner that, that violates any sort of code of conduct. And who knows how high up that goes. Maybe, maybe the higher ups in the German parliament or government know exactly what was going on, but that doesn't mean that the people do. The people have a choice. I would assume that we 
are kind of trying to be some sort of republic democracy uh, a world instead of a dictatorship, a, a pyramid scheme. And so that's, that's, that's the involvement of, of the German government is, is Ramstein. Where, where does Ramstein Air Force Base fall into all this? And I can tell you that it's just the center point of all data points of information. Hi, my name is Daniel, and first of all, I would like to thank you for being here and for speaking up. Um, Rammstein is not the only connection to Germany, I can assure you, because I participated in three missions in Afghanistan between 2005 and 2008. Um, and when I checked my experience with uh, the WikiLeaks Afghan uh, logs and uh, also with reports that went to the German parliament, uh, I saw the same lies you described, and it was the lies of politicians uh, spread via media, which I saw, which I experienced, which made me speak up as well. And uh, yeah, I can I can assure you, you're not the only nation who is part of the problem. It's a NATO-wide problem. Uh, we don't have full reports about the victims we create in all these areas. They are kept away from uh, the records, they are kept away from media, and even from uh, parliament and from parts of the uh, German government as well. And uh, I worked on to prove this. This is part of the PTSD I also share. And uh, although I never had to kill, um, knowing about uh, having participated in that shit um, changed my life. Thank you for speaking up here, and I hope we find some uh, time afterwards to talk about. Thank you very much, and thank you for what you've done. Thanks again. Um, I have a question about your, the, uh, the thing you said last, which was about the cold reception in your country. Uh, could you say a bit more about that? Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's been interesting because when I, when, I, you know, when I first started talking, I was you know, hospitalized and I was injured. I was, I was dying. I ex really fully expected to die two years ago. And um, I get, when, when, I, when the article first came out on December 17th of 2012, I got this really this super negative reaction from people that were that I had worked with people people that I loved and trusted and I cared about were telling me that oh you should go eat a fucking bullet you if you like one person that I particularly remember because I was very much his I guess I thought I was his friend he told me that if I was ever in a location where they were flying armed drones and they knew that they were looking at me they would shoot me without any order to shoot. Even if they had an order to not shoot, they would shoot me anyway. And um, I mean, it, bravado, posturing, whatever you want to call it, it still hurt. It still, it, it still was, it was really destructive to, to my self-esteem of the being of who I was. And then it was once, uh, of course, then people, uh, uh, there was, there's this blog called thisainthelled.com of, I think. I don't know. These, these guys are probably some of the biggest assholes that I've ever met. And they accused me of stolen valor. They accused me of lying. And so I go onto their blog and I was like, hey guys, let's talk about this. And they were just like, fuck you. Like, you're a drone operator. You're a Ninten like, Nintendo warrior. Like, and I was like, really? Like, I killed people that I didn't know who I killed. And then they're like, oh, just get over it. You're a, you're a soldier. Get over it. And I'm like, I think, I, think, I think my mom's level of care and conditioning for me growing up uh, has enabled me to overcome my military training. And, and they didn't like it, so, so there was a group of veterans from this website who were threatening to kill me. They were threatening to hunt me down and kill me. And some of them were from Montana, my home state. And it, it, it just is like, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying anything that isn't true. I'm not releasing secret information that isn't like kind of already known, you know, through other means and manners. But it's like, you talk about this, like I'm sitting here saying, hey, we're supposed to be awesome. We're supposed to be America for freedom and justice and liberty for all. And we're fucking it up. And we should take responsibility for our actions. And they're just like, you're a traitor. You're a traitor and we will hunt you down. 
And I learned, uh, I, was, I was scared, and of course, I'm not sure if I was really scared, but it was more like, like what, ha what will happen to me? What will happen to my family? Like, well, if, what, what happens if someone will come after me? And it's ruined, it's ruined friendships, relationships, my family relationships. And um, so, it, and it came to the point was like, like, am I, what do I believe in? Do I believe I'm doing the right thing? Of course I believe I'm doing the right thing. And, and does that matter? Does the pride, does the injured pride of the people who are super patriotic and can't look past their own noses at what's going on in the world, how they're represented in the world, like how they're represented in, I don't think people understand, the United Americans understand how much their reputation has been ruined because of our supposed war on terror and war on drugs. No one looks at us as, as, as any sort of leader other than like if we don't follow what America says, we're going to get bullied. And so, you know, pointing this stuff out to people doesn't make me a friend to anybody. Like, I don't, I'm pretty sure there's like almost no one in America that I could say, tell, tell any of this stuff to and they'd be like high-fiving me. Like, they, they just they either don't care or they're so pissed off and patriotic that they, they want to do harm because they're, are my country's being caught be doing harm. You know, it, it's this weird, it's all fuckered up is what it is. I, I, I couldn't even, uh, it's like a big ball of tangled yarn that I have no time or energy to disassemble. Yeah, I have a question for you. And I wanted to ask you, you were mentioning that drones are... Um, can be a faster light. Yeah, that drones are usually used also for surveillance. So we know that they're used to create uh, patterns of life analysis, like crossing, uh, for example, phone record and travel schedules. And could you tell us a bit more about that? I mean, how does it work uh, and how is actually done? So, um, you were talking about like, how do we gather like the intelligence that goes along with using this technology? And, and it's, if you're looking, if we're just looking solely at, um, you know, the, okay, so the NSA said something about, you know, we're only gathering metadata whenever, when they, when they got caught. When they got caught, of course, uh, uh, you know, on the, the chancellor of German, Germany, like her phone records had been uh, captured by the United States. The NSA responded, oh, we're just gathering metadata. But, but what's metadata? Like, it, is it, of course, it's just, uh, such a technical term that people are like gonna dismiss it because it's like, oh, they're, they're not actually, they're not really monitoring us, they're just monitoring parts of us. But what they do is they, they monitor the cell phone number or the VIN number associated with the cell phone. They monitor the SIM card associated with the cell phone. They monitor the numbers that are being from the caller and the person that's being called. They monitor the amount of time that's being talked. They monitor the amount of messages that is being passed. And then they, they build this web. So it starts off with two people and then maybe at some point when, when people were getting wise to what we were doing, they started exchanging SIM card numbers. And so now, because these two numbers are associated together when they're gathering this signals intelligence from the aircraft, now this SIM card number is associated with someone else and it makes that connection. And maybe the, the, the SIM card, the new SIM card that's in this new number, like it's, it's now making all these other connections and all these other calls and so that's how they build this web of, of who is bad and who isn't, basically just based off of, of the signals intelligence and the human intelligence that they can, they can gather and it's really just, it's incomplete. Uh, we, ha we have something on the aircraft called a Gilgamesh pod, which this is actually secret information, but it's been released. So, Hopefully I don't get in too much trouble for this. So the Gilgamesh pod, what it is, it's a mobile cell tower. And what this mobile cell tower does is it pulls from, like, so this is a, this is a cell phone tower, right? And we've got an aircraft over here. Well, your cell phone's always searching for the strongest signal. And the cell phone tower that's established will always be the strongest signal. But what this, what, what we have, what this pod on the aircraft does was when we put in numbers to pick up, it, it does this sweep of the area. So it pulls in every number that's being used and runs it through the system. It's kind of like water. But once that number comes up, all of a sudden it pings it and tries to pull that number from the cell phone tower. And this is how they kind of got wise to us, is that once we started pulling those numbers 
batteries were draining because the cell phone is fighting us and it's fighting the tower at the same time. So we would only have them asso associated or, or know where they're geolocated for a few minutes at a time, but then they would start shutting, when they would notice that they'd shut off their phones or they'd take out their battery or they'd do, some, do something else. But uh, that, that's essentially how the, it worked when I was in. They probably changed tactics, they probably changed methodologies, but that's as far as like, I understood how it worked when I was, when I was in. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask about the reaction to the media in, a, in your own country, other than, say, in Europe. And uh, when, once you declared, you know, your change? Um, well, the, I think that the media in, the Ameri in America just wants this, like, super sens sens sensationalization of, of whatever is being said. I, we call it guilt porn, actually, <laughs> as a joke. Because, um, like, if, you, if you've seen any of the interviews that I've done, CNN does the, the perfect example of it. The lady opens up, imagine killing over 1,500 people, people from inside of a bunker. Like, that's how she opens up. And so there, there's, no, there's no respect in the media. And even if, even if you look at my interview that I did last week in BBC Hard Talk, I mean, when, I, when we talked about PTSD, the guy's like, but you're really, you, you weren't on the ground. You weren't there in the shit. You weren't there actually killing people. So how can you claim to have PTSD? And, and what, they're, what these people, what they do is they just try to discredit. Like, they, they, just, they just try to use fancy words or, or, or this hard rhetoric in order to just discredit whatever you're saying. But there's, there's so much hard evidence out there. There's so much hard evidence that you can watch someone get into a car accident and have PTS. And it's not a disorder. It's something that we all experience on very different levels. I've never, ever said that what I've experienced is worse than the guys on the ground because I've seen what the guys on the ground experience, and I couldn't even imagine being there. I couldn't imagine being there on the ground with heavy body armor, a loaded weapon, having to worry about if this guy that's sitting around the corner popping shots off at, a, uh, at me is going to actually hit me or it's going to hit the guy next to me and whether I'm going to get home safe because that was never a worry. I, that was nothing I ever had to worry about. What I had to worry about is, am I following what my convictions of the right were? And I wasn't. What I had to worry about is, is are my leadership making the right decision utilizing this technology in the most responsible manner? And they weren't. And, and when I, whenever I brought issue to the matter, I was told to shut up in color, and that was, that w the issue was quashed. And so I had to go against what I intrinsically felt and believed what was right in order to do this. And that's, that's the biggest difference. Like, like, I also felt guilty because I wasn't over there. I felt like, I felt like a pussy. Like, I mean, you have, like, no, no military man wants to be in the military and feel like he is the weakest link. That's why, that's why when you read stories about in the last couple thousand years of, of military conquest and stuff, that you never see like the hardships of what's going on. You never, you never see the soldier's pain. That's why they call it sh shell shock in World War One, Two, um, and then uh, whatever it was that they called it in, in Vietnam, uh, and, and that's why you see this progression, like, you see, you look back, and it, and it existed. It existed for thousands of years. That's why warrior culture remained such a separate but integral part of society, is because people understood that it was needed, but there was, there were, there was a different type of understanding. When, you know, when the warriors would go off and they would fight to protect their home, they were really fighting to protect their home. There was, there was no, like, the only people that invaded were empires. And so when you, looked at, when you look at uh, the people that when they'd go off and fight and they'd come back, of course it affected them. They, had, they, had, they, like, they, they, they killed people, they probably lost brothers in arms, and, and while there was this degree of cultural separation, they still, they still felt that trauma, but there were people that understood and helped them get through it. There were the shamans and the witch doctors and, and, and the dreamers who, who would come in and, and help Go, they would go through rituals, but we've, we've lost that. We've lost that spiritual aspect of being a part of, 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 of what it meant to understand human nature and our connection to violence and our connection with each other and what it does to us. Um, yeah. Hi, thank you very much indeed. It's been a, a pleasure to hear you talk. Um, 
This year, the start of this year, there's a lot of reports about a great deal of dissatisfaction amongst the uh, Predator and Reaper crews of the US Air Force. People were quitting, people were uh, bitching. Uh, the US Air Force was uh, upping their pay. They were talking about having medals not too long ago. And yet, why is yours the only voice that we've heard out of this sort of very disaffected, dissatisfied, high rate of PTSD section of the military? Uh, could you repeat that last sentence? Sorry. Why, so why, why, why have you been one of very few US Air Force pilots, uh, drone and predator pilots to speak out, considering the dissatisfaction, high rates of PTSD and so forth? I actually got this answer the other day because someone came up, someone messaged me the other day and told me that what, they were proud of what I was doing and I hadn't heard from them in years. And so I asked them, I was like, I was like well, why haven't, you said anything. And most of these people, they, they'll get out and they'll do contractual jobs. They'll be getting paid a significant amount of money. They'll, they're comfortable where they're at. Um, but it's also more of the fact is like, this is a family thing. There's a mob mentality. Like you don't go complaining to the media or authorities about family issues. You don't go airing your dirty laundry. But I also recognize that as things were going, as things are continually to go, there's not gonna be any sort of change inside the program. Change has to come from outside of the program. People aren't gonna hold themselves accountable if there's no one to, to hold them to that. And so there has to be the journalistic perspective. This is, I, I wanted to be a journalist when I first went to college. Like I, I value that part of um, our society is that that's the, journalists are supposed to be there to be like, this is the shit that's going on, everybody wake up. And unfortunately with you know, propaganda and stuff, it's kind of got this con convoluted sense. But really that's what it comes down to is while some people agree with me, they're just upset the way that I did it. Um, but they also don't understand, like, probably no, none of them understood that I was hospitalized and I was in a desperate bind to redeem my soul, you know, you know if you want to call it that. And so, um, you know, a lot of these people are, they're just, they're just butthurt. Maybe they think that I'm getting profit off of this, which I've, I've, I, I've never gotten profit off of any of this. I've done this all of free of charge. I think, think that that is probably the, the biggest thing that's, that's helped me. Um, stay satisfied with myself in doing this is that I believe in the intrinsic nature of truth and justice over any sort of uh, physical gain or like that and I and it's really um, you know it's a lot has to do with the leadership too like uh, the leadership they put pressure on people um, when I was in you know people were complaining uh, they wanted to go to a psychologist and we were told we couldn't. We'd get our security clearances taken away, we'd get kicked out of the military, we'd be dishonorably discharged. So there's that real fear. I think that when people, like some people, they re-up their enlistment, so they're just biding time. It's just, a, it's just a matter of time until more people come out. And Chris Woods came out with a book called Sudden Justice, and there's 12 total operators, including myself, in the book, some agreeing with me, some disagreeing with me. And I think that as we progress, through um, people wanting to know more about it, we're gonna see a lot more people come out. And I, I'm really, hopefully, like, if, if they wanna just take the reins from me, they can go right ahead because I'm ready to move on with my life. And, uh, but until that happens, I'm still ready to do this until the very end, you know. Um, I was wondering uh, to what extent drone operators are aware of the of the path that the signal takes to and from these drones, and if you could elaborate specifically on, on the importance of, of Ramstein Air Force Base relay station uh, to the operations of drones in, in various countries. See, a lot of my information that I picked up is fringe information because we weren't really privy to this. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of got lucky simply for the fact that I was so enthusiastic about the technical aspect of my job. I, I'm, I mean. I feel like I'm a reasonably intelligent human being, so um, you know, I, I did enjoy the technical aspect. I enjoyed, you know, the makeup of the the software. I enjoyed how they were, uh, the, the the how the makeup of the GCS went, and you know how all this technology was interconnected and where we were getting our intelligence from. And so we kind of, we are aware of the pathways that this information takes 
just by doing our job, like every, every aircraft launch that we make, we have to call Ramstein Air Force Base to make sure that the signal is strong enough to reach us. So we, un we do know that, but we don't know anything beyond that. We don't know who runs the, the relay. We don't know, um, we actually, we don't even get to talk, now that I think about it, we don't even get to talk to the people that, that connect us. We have to call a civilian contractor who basically their entire job is to work with the signal. So they, like even those contractors, like they don't tell us anything. So all of our information is just fringe information. It's like table scraps, like, like we're dogs sitting at the foot of their master waiting for scraps to fall, scraps of intelligence to fall down. So uh, it, it's really hard to say like how complete is our viewpoint when I, I, look, I look at it and, it's, and, and there's so much more that probably people like, like John Getz who will be here later could probably answer in a more concrete manner. Yeah, so just mentioning John Goetz, I think I will step in and uh, first of all I want to thank a lot uh, Brando for this uh, first uh, opening speech and uh, so just uh, we want to thank you. Thank you very much for having me.